Hello, I'm Nat Goodspeed, and for the last eight years I've been working at Linden Lab on Second Life. During that time, I've developed a sort of fascination with C++ concurrency. You might almost say an obsession, a mania. I will let you characterize it however you want once we're done. So, what are fibers? Fibers are independent threads of execution being very careful to use that phrase in the sense intended by the C++ standard. But from now on, whenever I say thread, I mean an operating system thread. By user land, I mean that the operating system is not involved in context switching between fibers. That means that a fiber explicitly gives up control. It suspends, allowing other fibers to run. Cooperative suspension has another important implication. On a single processor system, let's face it, at most even one thread can be running at a time. But OS threads use time slicing to interleave thread execution in a way that, from the code's point of view, is completely unpredictable. You don't know when code on some other thread is going to be touching a shared resource. Cooperative fiber context switching means that application code can know when it's not being unpredictable, that it's not unpredictably being interleaved with other fibers on the same thread. Code accessing a shared resource can know that no other fiber on the same thread is trying to access it at the same time. Of course, the scope of this exclusivity is within a given thread. If you have a resource shared between fibers running on different threads, all bets are off, as usual. Fibers use what ISO has recently been calling suspend by call or suspend downwards. <clears throat> I'll say more about that in a minute or so. Like a standard thread, like a boost coroutine, each fiber runs on its own separate stack. Asymmetric coroutines are great when the application has a kind of a handshake relationship with a coroutine. A generator is a particular example. Application code starts one up, talks to it for a while, and then destroys it. A fiber doesn't necessarily have the same close relationship to the code that launches it. It's particularly valuable in a fire and forget kind of scenario. Some function f launches a fiber, expecting the new fiber to continue running even after function f returns. If you wanted to try to build such a thing using coroutines, you'd need to introduce some sort of manager to own the coroutine instances. When a fiber context switches away, it does not specifically resume its invoker, unlike a coroutine. Instead, it engages a scheduler to decide which fiber to resume next. You can think of the fiber library as coroutines plus a manager plus a scheduler. This may be an easier question to answer than it might appear, at least for this audience. I suspect that most of you have at least a glimmer of interest, or you wouldn't be here. But let's zoom out a little. Heck, let's zoom out a whole lot. To design a non-trivial program, you start off with pretty broad strokes and a lot of hand-waving. You say grandly that this subsystem is going to take care of this problem, and this other subsystem is going to take care of that problem. C++ is an object-oriented language. It encourages us to compose objects representing various layers of abstraction. Those objects rely on still lower level objects and so forth. To be able to reason about a program's behavior, it is critical at any given layer of abstraction to be able to gloss over the fine details of the lower layers on which it's built. Similarly, all higher level layers must be able to ignore the implementation details of the layer we're considering at this moment. What you do not want is for the flap of a butterfly's wings in one subsystem to set off a hurricane in the other subsystem. I don't know if any of you guys would consider a bit of pro bono work to clean up the world weather system. It's huge, it's old, it's massively parallel, and it's got a lot of globals. <laughs> I think we can all agree that this is not the kind of unintentional coupling we want in our own programs. 
This is mom and apple pie. This is programming 101. But programming 101 has been struggling to cope for some time now. When you look at an event-driven program, it's organized instead by when it must return to the main event loop and when it hopes to get control again. And event-driven applications have been with us for decades now. Moreover, we're being asked to interleave more and more functionality. Consider type ahead hints. While the user is typing into some input field, the application matches the partial input thus far against a list of likely candidates. That list is even more useful if it's dynamically fetched from the backend service than if it's baked into the local application. That involves fetching and updating the display in real time while the user is typing. Users have very little patience for an application that periodically freezes up while it consults its backend host. They want it to be responsive 100% of the time, even if it hasn't yet finished, it's the answer to their question. In other words, users expect an application to handle a lot of different things concurrently, most especially lively UI interaction along with snappy web service requests. Since C++ 11, to be honest, since well before then, it might seem obvious that the easiest way to achieve concurrency is to introduce new threads. You can spin them up and join them. You have lots of available synchronization primitives. You can use package task or promise and future to manage background computation of a value. Because the operating system manages threads, it can transparently do the right thing when you have a blocking I.O. call. It's, it blocks only the calling thread, not the whole process. The trouble with threads is that they're too simultaneous. Threads are truly parallel, not merely concurrent. Sharing resources between threads quickly becomes quite tricky. A trivial example is incrementing a counter. We might write counter plus equals one and think no more about it. But at machine instruction level, that increment operation might be implemented as read, add, write. And if two different threads happen to try to increment the same counter at the same time, they might both read the value five both increment the register to six and both write six, when of course the counter should have been updated to seven. So we need to defend every shared resource in any of several ways. Some of those ways can be expensive. I do not work in an environment with thousands of semi-independent tasks. I personally am more concerned about the timing implications of threads than their performance problems. But some of you do, and by this time you're all too aware that as the number of OS threads becomes much, much greater than the number of available processor cores on the machine, the system starts thrashing because context switching overhead starts to dominate. Those of you who work in a 32-bit address space with thousands of semi-independent tasks are particularly aware of the cost of stack frames. Maybe this is only really an issue with the i386 processor family. As you well know, a typical C++ function call on a 386 machine involves decrementing the stack pointer. So let's look at a 32-bit address space. A clever operating system reserves a pretty good sized chunk of address space for the process stack. Of course, this is not to scale. It doesn't have to commit all that memory, not yet. Not until the program actually uses it. Whoa, big stack declaration. And the next function pushes us over the limit. Not to worry, the clever operating system, seeing that there's no conflict, simply grows the range of addresses reserved for the process stack and lets the program continue. That works fine as long as the operating system is clever enough to keep the program's other allocations well out of the way. But what about when you launch a new thread? Again, you don't have to commit all that memory immediately, but you do have to reserve a prudent address range. How about when you launch another thread? There's only one place in the entire 32-bit address space where you can hope to grow the reserved address range on demand. For any thread other than the initial one, once you hit the limit, you're done, game over. You can't move a thread stack. 
there are potentially lots and lots of pointers referencing its contained objects. You don't know where all of those pointers live. So a clever operating system will reserve a big chunk of address space for a thread, say a megabyte. But guess what? There are only 4,096 megabytes in the entire 32-bit address space. And a lot of those are already used for the program code itself and for other data. This approach to stack management may strike some of you as overly simplistic. We could have a fascinating conversation about alternative implementations for C++ programs logical stack. But the bottom line is that the operating system doesn't know them, doesn't use them, and even if it did, it couldn't assume that your program uses them. This is still a problem even if your system has lots more physical memory than that. The limiting factor here is the 32-bit address space. The corollary is that a 64-bit process shouldn't really face this problem. There, the ultimate limiting factor will be the system's virtual memory. I don't know how much longer those of us swimming with thousands of concurrent tasks will have to stay in a 32-bit pool, but for now, it's an issue. So let's talk a bit more about data races and prevention. A straightforward approach would be a standard unique lock of a standard mutex. You're, you're asking the operating system to check whether the mutex is available, so you always incur the cost of a kernel entry. Consider the case when the mutex is not available. In that case, the calling thread is suspended. Some other thread is resumed on the processor. The original thread makes no progress while the mutex remains locked by someone else. When it's finally unlocked, the OS switches context back to the original thread. I submit that we don't often consider the impact of using threads on the development process itself. There is a way of thinking about potential data races that's mm, step up from what I would consider the industry norm. There are certain defensive patterns, certain idioms that must be learned. This is an arena in which, unfortunately, the weakest link phenomenon can really bite your butt. Innocent maintenance by someone unused to thinking in these terms can silently undermine the robustness of your whole process. So you make doubly sure to get your code reviewed, right? You all do that, right? Naturally, your reviewer must be someone versed in the potential issues. Such people can be a scarce resource in your development team. A big part of the problem is that the language itself provides very little help. Compilers don't emit Warning, potential data race. At least not the compilers I use. The trouble is that an undefended access to a resource that might inadvertently be shared between threads looks perfectly natural. It looks just the way C++ code is supposed to look. Nothing jumps out to call your attention to it. No big, ugly reinterpret cast syntax or anything like that. It's actually a properly defended access that sticks out like a sore thumb. So part of the cost is scouring your code base to identify possible race conditions, depending on how long the code existed before threads were introduced and the weakest link to have maintained it since then, that might or might not be a significant component of the overall cost. So what happens when you overlook a resource inadvertently shared between threads? Two words. As you well know, this can take almost any form, from an erroneous counter through program crash. As you also know, a crash is the good case, appearing to run sanely while producing results that are subtly wrong is the worst possible kind of bug. Nope, that's too sunny. How about a program that appears to run correctly while occasionally producing results that are subtly wrong. Threads, anyone? As I said, the C++ language does not as yet provide a whole lot of help here. There are a few tools available, for instance, Helgrind, DRD, and Thread Sanitizer. 
These tools instrument your program to try to detect data races at runtime. Thread Sanitizer's homepage states that it typically slows program execution by a factor of five to 15 times while consuming five to 10 times the normal memory. That would be great if it could guarantee a clean bill of health. But as you already know, runtime trapping can only catch bugs that you actually drive during that session. With timing problems, it's worse than exhaustively exercising every code path, which is already effectively impossible for non-trivial programs. A guarantee of thread safety would require considering every possible interleaving of each thread's instructions with those of every other. Maybe that would make a good basis for a crypto system. So if we need our applications to process both user input and some number of backend queries simultaneously, but for any a number of reasons we're dubious about introducing lots of threads, what other options are available? Classic blocking I.O., or synchronous, is based on a very simple API. You call a function. The calling thread stops dead until the function has results available. In the case of web services, this may take milliseconds to seconds. But the straightforwardness of the API is perfectly aligned with everything we've learned about good program organization. Async I.O., or an async API in general, though I.O. is the commonest use case, is based on calling a function that initiates an operation, then returns immediately before results are ready. The operation continues in the background in parallel with whatever is going on <coughs> in the calling program. Finally, the operation notifies the caller with results, typically by calling a callback function. That's it. That solves the problem. That's how we get more concurrency without adding threads with all their attendant problems. With a good async API, the completion callback is called at a well-defined time, not between two instructions in the middle of the code for some C++ expression. It's worth noting that async APIs are becoming more popular. For instance, the WinRT API only supports async access to resources such as on-screen messages and dialogues, file access, internet connectivity, socket streams, devices, sock and services, and calendar contacts and appointments. The trouble is, now significant parts of your logic, anything depending on that async result, must be extracted to a completion callback. This can have a disruptive effect on your carefully designed program organization. Suddenly, in the middle of a lower level abstraction layer, you must abruptly return to the application's main event loop. Then you must be able to re-enter that layered logic at the point where you left off. It gets worse. How about when a subsequent result, async operation depends on the result from the first? How about when a third operation depends on the result from the second? Maybe you're thinking, Psh, lambdas, done. Any of you ever seen JavaScript code based on node.js? Whoa, whoa, sit down, please. Please don't run screaming. I promise I won't mention it again. What tends to happen is that you evolve chains of callbacks, each with a bit of the relevant code, a bit of the relevant data. You start thinking despairingly to yourself, but it used to be so nice. It was all carefully arranged into different subsystems with different layers of abstraction. You might say, aha, how about future then? I can link one operation to another. Have you noticed how there are already proposals creeping in for chaining a subsequent operation only on error or only on success? How about a generalized conditional chaining operation? Can we introduce a looping construct? We're trying to layer a whole new language on top of C++. We've already got four of them. The preprocessor, the runtime language, the template language, and the const expert language. Reports from the C-sharp trenches suggest that chains of then are not much more fun to maintain than chains of plain old callbacks. 
You might say, aha, how about state machines? I can build a machine that manages instances of state classes. Each new entry transitions to the next state. We even have a couple of boost libraries for this. I've been there. Trust me, it gets opaque pretty fast. <sighs> you have to reverse engineer the state transition table to figure out what should have been obvious control flow. You might say, but how about a big switch statement? You set an int representing state. Every time you re-enter the function, you switch immediately on the state variable. If you cleverly lay out the case values so that subsequent states are adjacent, if you squint a little, it even kind of sort of looks like normal C++ control flow. In fact, courtesy of a bit of preprocessor magic and one of the odder syntax anomalies inherited from classic C, Boost ASIO supports a pretty veneer over the big switch statement. It's called Duff's device. And in fact, Boost ASIO's is only one of a number of readily available implementations of the idea. Using that, your function looks even more like normal C++ control flow. No squinting required. The trouble with that is it obscures the fact that you're actually returning from and re-entering that function every time. Local variables get reinitialized every time. Any state that you would have kept in local variables must be moved somewhere else, say a heap struct. In fact, Microsoft Visual Studio 2015 introduces compiler support for this idea. For a resumable function, it generates code that actually stores locally declared variables in a generated heap struct. It implicitly performs the big switch statement for you. This is kind of sort of great. As long as you're working at a single layer of abstraction, you're good. Where it has difficulties in, in supporting multiple layers of abstraction. The caller of each resumable function must be aware that it might either produce a result immediately or return, nope, not yet. Those lucky few who attended Daniel's in my session Wednesday might be thinking, I know, I know, pick me, pick me. I know where this is going. Coroutines. And you're close. You really are. But I will show you a still more excellent way. Nobody ever mentioned that St. Paul was a programmer? Fibers are the best way I know to organize code already based on async IO. Why the qualification? Why not just say the best way to organize code, period? It's because of blocking IO. Code that wants to share its host thread with other fibers must avoid making any calls that will block the whole thread. When you call, say, receive on a socket, control enters the operating system. It doesn't return until data have arrived or the socket is closed. It doesn't pass control to the fiber library to say, got anything else you can do in the meantime? But once you're committed to using async IO, you're all set. But if you're one of those people swimming with thousands of concurrent tasks in a 32-bit pool, you may be thinking, but stacks. So yes, each fiber does have its own stack. That's one of the strengths of fibers. And you still can't move them. I just have a couple of things to say about fiber stacks. First, unlike with standard thread, you can explicitly specify the stack size for a fiber. I'm not a fan personally, because how do you know? How do you know that your prior analysis remains valid after this last round of maintenance? How do you know your QA caught the deepest recursion case on each fiber? But the fact remains that if you must fine tune your stack consumption, you do have that knob. In fact, if you want still finer grain control, you can provide your own stack allocator. I'm more enthused about the ability to engage compiler innovations such as segmented stacks. It's a classic time-space trade-off. When you set the slider to fast, you use more memory. When you set the slider to small, 
you use more cycles. But here's the point. You can leverage technologies like these because fiber stacks are managed by user land code. You don't need the operating system to grasp the concept. Several different people have suggested, hey, why not use Microsoft Resumable Functions as a back-end implementation for fibers? Then the whole issue of stack allocation vanishes because they're stackless. I could pause here to let you guys work out exactly how to make that go. I have no doubt that many of you are brighter than I am. The world would be in your debt. So what's the problem? Resumable functions suspend by return, or suspend up and out. Fibers, like stackful coroutines, suspend by call, or suspend down. A fiber calls some function. That function calls another function. That other function might choose to suspend. In practical terms, the implication is that the caller of a resumable function must always be prepared to deal with a not yet answer. Standard future is one way to express that. The await keyword, or whatever the standards committee ends up calling it, is the magic syntax that wraps up that ambiguity. Hmm, the answer is not yet available. I myself must suspend until then. But uh-oh, every resumable function that might suspend must be able to communicate that ambiguity to its caller, which means its caller must be prepared to suspend. It's viral. Every function in the call chain must change its signature and its body to propagate that possible suspension. Then every function not in that particular call chain must also change the way it calls any of the affected functions. I don't know about you, but in our organization, QA is a scarcer resource than developers. If I fix a little bug in a leaf function, and in the process change the semantics of 30 functions at five levels of abstraction, that's going to cost. So what do we have to test? Well. Um, everything. You could say, well, OK, if resumable functions require pervasive annotation, clearly the set union of resumable functions and fibers would be to require pervasive annotation for fibers too. No, stop. I use fibers because I reject pervasive annotation. And if that's your solution to unifying fibers and resumable functions, why would you bother? What does it actually buy you over using resumable functions on their own? <laughs> in case you haven't yet guessed, I strongly believe in the benefits of having a stack for each fiber. Most importantly, they give us the ability to write code that looks and acts just as if we were performing classic blocking I.O. We get to keep our clean subsystem design with its layers of abstraction. We get to keep our local variables. You might have wondered, well, what about thread local storage? Isn't that going to be shared between all the fibers running on a particular thread? It's true. I might point out that this can be useful. They share it without racing for it. Some functionality wants to be thread scope rather than fiber scope. You might be interested to know that sharing thread local data is typical for the present implementations of other fine-grained concurrency as well, such as GPU and SIMD support. But so far, I've gotten what I wanted by using local stack variables instead of thread local or fiber local storage. All good so far? Any questions? I know it's after lunch. Everybody wake up. So yes. There is fiber local storage. The fiber API is based on the standard thread API, reflecting the role of fibers as user land threads. It supports the usual suspects.
In addition, we get these fiber-aware communication cues, as you might suspect from their names. A producer fiber can push an arbitrary number of items to an unbounded channel at risk of arbitrary memory consumption, whereas a bounded channel imposes a user-specified limit, suspending the producer fiber if it tries to exceed that limit. But I'm not going to walk you through each and every one of these because, aside from the fact that you can read about them yourself, the point of mirroring the thread API is that you should be able to infer their semantics from the thread API. So why all the duplication? Why do we need fiber variants of these things at all? It's because the standard implementation blocks the entire thread. As we noted earlier, if you're trying to run more than one fiber on a thread, you pretty much want to avoid that. The fiber library provides objects and operations that block just the calling fiber, allowing other fibers to continue running on the thread. Or I should say, exactly one fiber. Wouldn't it be cool if we could customize the way the standard library operations suspend, then we wouldn't need redundant implementations of all these things. I'll leave that as an exercise for you guys. Yes, Richard. Yes. They don't well, concurrently in that they take turns, but not in parallel because they're not all running at the same moment. So, do you need new protecting? Okay, that's an excellent question. And I asked that question when I came to this API. Within a particular thread, you don't need to protect data accesses. Why would you need a mutex? It's because you might be running fibers on more than one thread. And you would like to be able to suspend this fiber on thread B in such a way that it can gain access to this resource that's also being accessed by this fiber on thread A and still allow the other fibers on thread B to run in the meantime. What I'd rather talk about is usage patterns, how to integrate the library to solve problems you actually face. For starters, how about async I.O.? I keep talking grandly about how fibers let you write code that looks and acts like you were using classic blocking I.O. I talked about the necessity to use async I.O. But isn't there kind of an impedance mismatch? Callbacks push. Blocking functions, well, return results. So let's work an example. Here's an API with an init read call accepting a callback. Here's an adapter. We declare a promise of standard string. We capture that promise as future. Then we pass to the init read function a lambda that binds our promise using initialization capture. The lambda's signature matches the callback required for init read. Then, since init read returns immediately, we call future get. This blocks the calling fiber until the future is fulfilled, one way or another. Eventually, the operation completes and the lambda is called. If the past error code indicates success, we can call promise set value with the past data. But if the operation failed, we can instead call promise set exception. Either of those calls will wake up the future get call. If it was set value, our read function just returns the past data item. If it was set exception, get throws that exception. Does that seem like a lot of boilerplate to adapt a callback? But it's localized. That's part of what I like so much about having a stack. Encapsulation just works. Questions? Richard. So init read returns immediately, but you pass to it a callback to, re to receive a call when the operation completes. But I still need to block the future get. It's because this adapter is to make the, the fiber block. It's to adapt between async IO, which has this callback API, 
And a fiber is, you know, what I'm saying is the great advantage of being able to write code that looks like it's doing blocking I.O., but you're blocking only that fiber. Other fibers on the thread continue to run. Yes. Some some async I/O. Yes. Exactly. So the idea is that instead of saying, "Oh, I have to do some async I/O," I need to construct a chain of callbacks. I'm going to wrap my async I/O. I'm going to allocate a fiber to doing that work. If the fiber needs to proceed to do further async I/O. Subsequent to getting that first result, it makes the other calls using normal C++ sequencing, using normal C++ control flow. <laughs> then there's non-blocking I/O. For instance, you can set a socket in non-blocking mode. If there's no data present, instead of blocking. A read operation returns e again, or e would block. That's great, but what then? You don't get a convenient callback. In practice, you have to keep polling. Here's an example non-blocking API. Notice that in addition to returning an error code meaning no data yet, this read method might return less than the desired length of data. In other words. In addition to polling until it returns an actual length rather than e would block, you might have to keep polling past any number of additional e would block returns until you've retrieved the whole desired data length. Here's an adapter. We'll call it read chunk because it might read only part of the desired data. It calls the non-blocking read API. And as long as the non-blocking read keeps returning e would block, we yield to other fibers on the same thread. If your other fibers have too little work to do, and your non-blocking read takes too long, you might consider actually sleeping the fiber instead of just yielding. We return when either we get a legitimate length or some other error. But of course, that length might still be less than the desired length. So here's a wrapper around read chunk to try to read the whole desired length. Until we've read the whole length, call read chunk again, and break if EOF or error. As long as we keep getting success, append the current chunk and loop back to try again. I know there are more efficient ways to concatenate string data. That's not the point here. We return when either we've read the desired length or we've got some kind of error. Remember, it won't be e would block. And finally, we can wrap all that up in a nice application-facing function that's guaranteed to return data because it throws if it gets an error other than EOF. That doesn't strictly need to be a separate function from read desired. I'm just pointing out yet again that you can layer these idioms as needed. Questions? OK, we're good. One of the nicer extensions you've seen floated around futures is the ability to trigger some action on fulfillment of the first of an arbitrary number of futures. For instance, you might want to fire off redundant queries to several semi-reliable backends and accept whichever answer arrives first, discarding the rest. But like future then, that feature is callback-based. Consistent with our quest for cleaner architecture, let's invert that. Let's say we want to launch some number of functions, each on its own fiber, each of which will wait until it's done. We want the calling fiber to wait until the first of them returns, not necessarily the leftmost one, the one that finishes first. So this will be a wait any function. If, in fact, we're sending off redundant queries, we're probably reusing the same function, just passing it different arguments. But just for fun, let's pretend we might have to invoke different functions. The result we want is the function's return value. I'll present a container-based wait any only because 
it takes less code on a slide than a variadic one. Of course, the return types must all be compatible. And just to raise the stakes, let's say we have to allow for the possibility that one or more of the task functions might throw an exception. We want to return the earliest successful result. I'm going to present this function in two acts because it's going to be tricky enough to squeeze everything onto a slide at a readable size. Since this template accepts an arbitrary sequence container of functions, I'm going to make the caller specify the desired return type. The key is that we're going to collect futures representing the result of each function. Make an unbounded channel of those futures. We use a shared pointer because wait any is going to return before the last of the fibers completes. That's the whole point of wait any. We loop over the functions in the container, counting them as we go. Remember, this is an arbitrary container. It might not have a size method. For each function, we launch a fiber with a lambda, binding the function in the channel shared pointer. We detach the fiber immediately. That's a common pattern. It distinguishes a background fiber versus one you intend to join later. In the lambda body, we instantiate a package task for the bound function. Package task is a wrapper that runs a function, capturing its return value if it succeeds, or its exception if not. Then we directly call the package task. This is a somewhat unusual use of package task. Normally, you might think of launching a package task in a new fiber, using its future to wait for results. Here, we're already in a new fiber. The point is this. We want our lambda fiber to wait until the bound function either returns or throws. If we were to immediately push the package task future to our unbounded channel, then wait any would always, always prefer the leftmost function, not necessarily the one that completes soonest. So we delay pushing the future until we know it's fulfilled. Only when the package task completes, only when its future has been fulfilled, either with a result or an exception, do we push it to the channel. OK, so far? Richard. Right. Giving them a particular channel so people will communicate back to you. Yes. But where do the fibers themselves um, live? Live? If you will, to allow you to continue making their fibers. If I understand, sort of, as you created the fiber, you said, hey, here's a fiber, uh, here's your task supposed to do, start running your task. Now, right. how did That's a good question. We wouldn't be doing this if not for the fact that we expect the, pack, the bundled functions to be using async I.O. And, and to be suspending. So it's within this call that the bound function is going to do some async I.O. and wait for it. At that point, we switch away and we continue creating fibers. OK, we've launched a bunch of fibers exactly count of them. Now for act two. We're going to loop at most count times. Why is that important? Because if every single one of count functions throws an exception, we could find ourselves trying to consume a value from a channel with no more producers. That would turn wait any into wait forever. Assuming we haven't yet exhausted all hope, we pop the next future from our channel. Naturally, this causes wait any to block until that future is pushed. Then we check whether the future was fulfilled with an exception or a value. The exception pointer returned by future get exception pointer is null pointer unless set exception was called. And we already know this future is fulfilled. Once we know the future is fulfilled with a value, we can close the channel. That means no subsequent producer will be succeed in pushing values to it, which is fine. Why waste the space? And then we can return this future's value. Of course, if we really do burn through count futures and every single one of them contains an exception, we should probably communicate failure to our caller somehow. Naturally, it would be helpful if we captured one or more of the exception pointers from the fibers. This is just a placeholder.
questions on this. Richard. Uh, is there a way to terminate the other work that's still proceeding? Sort of, I guess it would be one of those, wouldn't it be nice now that I have a result? Okay, all the other fibers, please stop what you're doing. The question is, couldn't I just terminate the other fibers and just make them go away? And the answer is, the fiber library, as until quite recently, had an interrupt function. Um, the author removed the function. It became clear that it wasn't susceptible to the identical set of problems with thread interruption. Nonetheless, it was susceptible to problems, especially at uh, process shutdown. And I would like to see that feature re-added robustly. He pulled it because it was not robust in its present implementation, and he just didn't want it obscuring the, the functionality. Other questions? Yes. Okay, so um, the question is, given the operating system context switching away to other processes, how do we know when we come back which of these fibers is going to resume, right? Um, so all of this is based on getting a callback from the async operation. I don't care what machinery the I.O. operation uses to give me that callback. What I care about is that when I get the callback, I can set a future value and resume the fiber that was waiting for it. I don't have to care about what the operating system was doing behind the scenes. Did I answer the question? Yeah, no, but it seems like the, whichever the first one you will get executed has a greater chance of succeeding getting the data finished. I see what you mean, and to me this tactic would be most valuable when you're querying network resources, and there could be a, a tremendous difference in latency between those network queries to where the time it takes to, for a round trip on the network way exceeds the amount of time it takes to s run each fiber long enough to set up the query. I see you're saying that if the wait time is short, then yeah, you would tend to prefer the leftmost one because most of the work would already be done and so forth. Um, but I was inventing a use case for when any, because there are people who are very excited about when any. And again, in my mind, the longer the round trip time to the server that you're querying, the more valuable this is for the arbitrary reordering of the results. You might think that wait all would be only a slight revision to wait any. And in fact, you could implement it that way. But I have to show you a variadic implementation that I just think is really cool. Since wait all necessarily waits until the last of the functions has completed, you don't have to worry about reordering them. You can present results in the order they're passed. In fact, you can just state the type of the result you want and return the whole thing, bam, in one swell foop. In fact, and I think this is seriously cool, you can even pass functions with heterogeneous return types and collect the results in a struct. So all we have to do is make a bunch of async calls, then pass all the futures down to a helper function, which merely initializes the desired result type with the results from the past futures. Tell me that isn't seriously cool. I love this. Just for grins, why do we even need the helper function? Why couldn't we use this implementation instead? It's because of the compiler's implicit iteration over the argument pack. This implementation makes a single pass. 
it launches the first function on a separate fiber. Then it waits for it. Then it launches the second function on a separate fiber, then immediately waits for it. In other words, this implementation serializes the past functions. It's effectively the same as this implementation, which doesn't even attempt concurrency. With this implementation, you get two different passes through the argument pack. The first pass launches all the fibers, collecting their features into another argument pack, over which the helper function makes a separate pass to wait for each of them. Notice the similarity to the two loops in act one and act two of our wait any function. Questions? Okay, we are good. I will now share with you the mystical incantation to integrate a classic event-driven program with the fiber library. That's it. That's all you need to do to ensure the fiber library can divert some cycles to the fibers you've launched. In general, the rule of thumb is just make sure you call this fiber yield often enough. If there are no other re ready fibers, it will return quickly. But if there are, it will run each of the ready fibers until its next suspend point. By the way, I want to point out something about this call that might not have struck you. For most purposes, the main function and the functions that it calls can be treated the same as a fiber that you've explicitly launched. You don't have to move your event loop into an explicitly launched fiber in order to make that yield call. The same is true for a function launched as a new thread. It's simply the default fiber for that thread, just as the main function runs on the default fiber for the default thread. Richard. Yes. Okay. And then with this one, um, is there any, uh, you're saying the, the way to make the event loop just behave more concurrent, that's the word, is to make sure you call yield. Could I just then sprinkle yield throughout? It's sort of yes. the same thing. And is, is that actually maybe a good way of doing it? Is just uh, put yield here and yield here and just sort of sprinkle on like salt throughout the, the, the fiber? Is, is that sort of a standard practice? this sort of context? Are there, are there better places to put yield for this? Is it best to put it after I dispatch something? Or do you put it after your get? Or do you put it after the translate? Or is it more of a, it, it, it just needs to occur somewhere? It needs to occur somewhere. There's a good case for sprinkling yield calls through any fiber code that is otherwise going to do a lot of stuff before its next yield point. Um, in the code that I've written so far, there's a lot of async IO. So there are natural yield points sort of baked into my logic. But if I was going to do a lot of stuff, including disk IO and stuff, and it was going to consume a long time before it did anything that was going to voluntarily suspend, yes, then sprinkling yields into that code to ensure that the other fibers weren't starving would be a good thing. What I like about this is that it's <clears throat> uh, fairly minimal maintenance. It doesn't require analyzing your code and sprinkling a lot of calls in before anything starts to work. You can do this and things start to work. And then if you find that some fiber is running too long and starving other fibers, you can sprinkle in yield calls to alleviate that problem. But what about when the main loop is inaccessible, embedded in some other application framework? We'll use Boost ASIO as an example, even though there's more to say about integrating specifically with Boost ASIO. A typical application performs some setup and then just passes control to IO service run. The run call doesn't wake up until the application shutdown. This illustrates a usage pattern we see with a lot of application frameworks. You have no direct access to the driving loop. 
One approach is to intercept control with a callback each time around the embedded main loop. With ASIO, you can affect that by continually reposting a handler that calls this fiber yield. Of course, you have to get the ball rolling initially. A problem with that approach is that when all fibers are blocked on pending I.O., so the I.O. service has no ready handlers either, ASIO and fiber could just spin the thread CPU, passing control back and forth to each other. If the framework you're dealing with supports timers, and remember, we're just using ASIO as an example at the moment, you could use a timer instead. That trades off busy spinning with responsiveness to I.O. completion. The framework you're using may or may not manifest this spinning issue. Questions? OK. <clears throat> One of the implications of using a user land fiber scheduler is you get to play too. The library's scheduling algorithm is a customization point. All you have to do is derive your new scheduler from the sched algorithm abstract base class and pop it in place with use scheduling algorithm. For understandable reasons, this must be the first fiber API call on a thread. The scheduling algorithm specifically handles fibers that are ready to run, but not yet running. I should reiterate that this is one of the distinctions between fibers and coroutines. When a coroutine passes control back to its caller, it's immediate, boom, the caller resumes. But when a blocked fiber is marked ready, it does not immediately resume. The act of marking it ready passes it to the scheduler. The scheduler decides which of the ready fibers should run next. The fiber manager, a library component, keeps track of the running fiber and any fibers that are actually blocked for whatever reason. The scheduler is responsible only for fibers that are actually ready to run. Remember our promised future example. I blithely stated that the set value call wakes up the future get call. More specifically, what happens is that the fiber blocked in future get is passed to sked algorithm awakened. First, I should explain that the scheduler always operates in terms of context pointers. A context instance is the implementation underlying a particular fiber. A fiber object, as instantiated by the application, is actually a smart handle to a context. That's why you can detach and forget a fiber object. Behind the scenes, the context in instance persists. I'll describe the intended uh, behavior of each of these methods in terms of the library's provided round robin implementation. Round robin is the default scheduler for any thread on which you do not call use scheduling algorithm. Round robin's awakened implementation simply puts the past context pointer on the tail of a queue. When the fiber manager wants to resume a ready fiber, it calls sked algorithm pick next. As you might suspect, the job of pick next is to return the context pointer for the fiber that should next be resumed. Round robin's pick next pops the head of its ready queue. That accounts for the round robin behavior. As fibers become ready, the scheduler cycles through each of them in turn. Obviously, other tactics are possible. That's where your implementation comes in. Has ready fibers simply reports to its caller whenever the ready queue is empty. Notice that the representation of the ready queue is completely up to your scheduler implementation doesn't have to be a queue at all. You only have to keep track of the context pointers passed to awakened and return each of them from pick next in some way that makes sense to you. For instance, your custom scheduler can, out, can associate custom properties with each fiber context. The library examples show how you could introduce a priority property and make pick next honor the relative priorities of different ready fibers. I'm not going to walk you through that right now, but that's one obvious use case for this kind of customization. I want to mention the last two customization methods. Suspend until is called when the fiber manager has no work to do. All avail available fibers are blocked. Instead of just spinning, 
it calls suspend and till. Some of the blocked fibers may have timeouts. Some may simply be sleeping. The past time point represents the soonest wake time of any of those, the soonest time at which the fiber manager might have to mark some fibers ready. Round Robin's suspend until uses an interesting strategy. It calls wait until on a standard condition variable, passing control to the operating system until the specified wake time. Why a condition variable? Why not just a this thread sleep until? because we also want to be responsive when something comes ready before the anticipated wake time, such as IO completion. Remember that the time point passed to suspend until might be a timeout where we hope and expect that something will happen before the timeout elapses. That's the role of the notify method. It's to wake up a pending suspend until call, letting it return to the fiber manager. The round robin notify implementation calls notify all in the condition variable. Boom, Stephen. So we expect all the other functions, the first four functions to be called from the thread of the fiber while notify can be called from a different thread? You got it. So the implication is that notify is the only one that has to be defended against cross thread access. Good question. And Richard. Well, again, a, a fiber can suspend in such a way that it says, but I want to be woken up at such and such time. It could say, I'm going to block on a fiber's condition variable, but I'm not going to wait past five minutes. Yes? Um. Okay, that's a fair question. Joe was asking, why raw pointers? Why don't we have um, a smarter pointer being passed around in terms of the context objects? I believe, I'm not the library author, I believe the answer to that question is that the author has no intention whatsoever of the fiber manager relinquishing control of that pointer. There is no implication of ownership transfer. The fiber, the context is always owned by the fiber manager it's just manipulated and selected by the scheduler. That's my belief. Okay. And now you know enough to share a group of fibers among participating threads. The next ready fiber will be picked up by whichever thread next asks. You know almost enough. There are a couple more calls you need to know. We'll get there. This get algorithm implementation can be found in the library's examples directory in worksharing.cpp. As you can see, it's based on a standard queue of context pointers. And look, the ready queue is static. Obviously, there are other ways that you could share a queue between the relevant um, schedulers. This is an expedient way, and it works for an example. Because we're sharing that ready queue between threads, we have to defend queue operations with a mutex. And yes, this was written before I attended Ansel's excellent talk and libguarded. <laughs> but there's also a non-static queue local to the scheduler instance in each thread. Uh -huh. Here's the awakened implementation. One of the methods on the context object allows you to test its type. Remember I said that for most purposes, a thread's default fiber can be treated the same as an explicitly launched fiber. The default fiber for a thread is launched by the operating system. It turns out to be a really bad idea to try to resume a thread's default fiber on some other thread instead. Also, the fiber library maintains an internal fiber for housekeeping purposes. That, too, should remain on its original thread. Both of those special fibers are marked as pinned context. So when awakened is passed either of those special fibers, we push it to the local queue instead of the shared queue. Otherwise, 
it's an explicitly launched fiber and we can do whatever we want to it. What we want is to detach it from the original fiber manager, preparing it to be possibly picked up by a different fiber manager on a different thread. And then, being careful first to lock our mutex, we can push the ready context onto the shared queue. Here's the first part of pick next. Checking the readability. Everybody can see this? Okay. <clears throat> Naturally, we have to lock the mutex even before checking if the shared queue is empty. If it has at least one context pointer, we pop it in the usual way and unlock the mutex. And then we attach the selected context to the active fiber manager. This is the whole point. This schedule is picked next will be called by the fiber manager from a different thread than the one that called awakened. And then of course we return that context pointer. But if the shared queue is empty, we can immediately unlock the mutex because we're done touching the shared queue. This is when we check if the local queue is empty. If there's at least one context pointer available in the local queue, we pop it and return it. Of course, if both queues are empty, we end up returning null pointer, which is okay. It tells the fiber manager there really are no ready fibers. You will have noticed that this particular implementation has the effect of prioritizing the shared queue over the local queue. A ready worker fiber will always be preferred over the thread's default fiber. You can address that if you want by associating a timestamp with each queue entry, then performing a merge on the queues. Each pick next call returns whichever front entry has the earlier timestamp. Feel free to add that refinement in your own implementation. Questions? Yes. Okay, the question is, why would we want to um, share fibers among threads? And um, there's a pattern that I think is commonly referred to as M by N, where you have a much greater number of fibers running than you have threads. Remember that we were told that threads are optimally sized when the number of active working threads in a given moment is a, roughly in parity with the number of available processors. Um, so there is some benefit to scaling up by introducing more fibers rather than more threads, but it's a load balancing kind of operation. If a fiber becomes ready, but the thread on which it's running is still doing something else, it could be picked up by another thread and continued. Yes, at that point you have to defend against cross-thread accesses. You have to have written your fiber to be aware that that's going to happen. But it is a way of managing load for a high level of um, parallel fibers. So it's kind of like work stealing. Yes. In fact, the example directory also has a work stealing example, which I didn't run through here. Richard. So, but, but at that point, why, if you're like sort of saying like, um, I ended up having um, a particular workload such that there are So the answer there, the question is, why would I want to interleave more um, fibers on multiple threads instead of just using the original number of threads for the number of tasks that I have? And the answer has to do with the overhead associated with context switching threads. To the extent that you can get away with locally context switching within a thread in user land, it's much faster, orders of magnitude faster. and so you actually get more performance out of having some greater number of fibers than you have threads. The maximum performance is when you can isolate the um, fibers doing task A using resources X, Y, and Z 
on a thread that's completely isolated from fibers accessing resources S, W, and T on another thread. And then you don't even have the synchronization problem and all the context switching is within those fibers within a given thread. But the work sharing, again, is a load balancing tactic if you find that sometimes some of the fibers are getting starved because they're very busy on the thread on which they're running. Okay. That's a good question. The question is, um, given that the library marks some fibers as pinned context, could you voluntarily mark certain fibers as, I don't want this one to migrate, only migrate ones that are not marked myself? So the answer literally is, I don't want you to mess with the pinned context type, but remember I said you can associate custom properties in your custom scheduler with each fiber context. So you could mark a don't migrate property with all of the contexts available and set that using whatever logic you want to. And then your scheduler would observe that property and avoid, it would push the affected fiber to the local queue rather than to the shared queue. Good question. Okay. Doubtless, you remember when I talked about integrating with an application framework with an embedded driving loop, I sort of hinted that ASIO is actually a bigger topic. We should be concerned about integrating with Boost ASIO because any non-trivial I.O. performed by a fiber must be asynchronous. ASIO is Boost's support for async I.O., as its very name states. Not only is this interesting in a Boost context, but ASIO is well on its way to becoming an ISO technical specification, eventually to be folded into the C++ standard. I believe the most recent draft is N4575. I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Re Recall that the thrust and repose tactic suffers from potentially spinning the thread CPU. Using a timer is friendlier to other threads, but less responsive. It basically guarantees that it will be at least 10 milliseconds, or whatever, before your fiber resumes on completion. Doing this well turns out to be a tricky topic. It's so tricky, in fact, that I'm not even sure that what's there now is the optimal approach. One of you might be able to suggest the next evolutionary step but let's walk through what we have so far. A few preliminary points. We must let ASIO suspend the running thread. In an ASIO-based application, this thread sleep, blocking on a standard condition variable, these are bad things. Why? Because ASIO can arrange to suspend the thread in such a way that the OS will wake it up on IO completion. Nobody else knows enough to do that. Therefore, when the fiber manager has no work, it goes dormant by passing control to ASIO. So naturally, in this environment, the fiber library is critically dependent on ASIO handler calls to wake it up again. That means that calling IO service stop too soon can bring everything to a screeching halt you get no more handler calls, and you don't shut down gracefully. Only call stop when everything is mostly cleaned up. This next point is distressing, but apparently unavoidable. In general, ASIO permits you to call run on the same IO service instance from several different threads. This is how threads register in a kind of ASIO thread pool ASIO can fire any ready handler on any of those participating threads. It's cool and I like it, but I just got done saying that the fiber library is critically dependent on ASIO handler calls for processor cycles. But a handler call on thread B 
is useless to a fiber manager on thread A. And I know of no way to constrain an ASIO handler call to run on a particular thread. Or let me rephrase that. The only way I know to constrain ASIO to run a particular handler on a particular thread is to ensure that that thread is the only thread currently calling run on its IO service instance. Maybe I'm overlooking something. I kind of hope so. <clears throat> Finally, it simplifies things if we require that the fiber calling IO service run is specifically the thread's default fiber. The first thing we must do, of course, is to use, is to call use scheduling algorithm. The constructor for this particular scheduler implementation, ASIO round robin, accepts a reference to the IO service instance, so we declare that first. Use scheduling algorithm instantiates the scheduler, which calls its constructor. The scheduler constructor binds the past IO service reference and initializes an ASIO steady timer. It calls add service with an instance of a nested service class. The choice of add service instead of use service is very deliberate. Add service throws service already exists if you try to add a particular service class twice to the same IO service instance. We can't outright prevent multiple threads from calling IO service run on the same instance, but at least we can hope to alert somebody who tries to pass the same IO service reference to instances of our scheduler on two different threads. So what is this service class? Every service class must be derived from IO service service. It stores a unique pointer to IO service work. The constructor forwards the past IO service reference to its base class as required, then initializes the unique pointer with a new IO service work instance. IO service work indicates to the past IO service instance that as long as that work object exists, the IO service should continue its main loop. In other words, the IO service should not return from a run call until that work instance is destroyed. Then the service constructor posts a lambda, about which I'll say more in a bit. Finally, our service class overrides the base class shutdown service virtual method. When that's called, we destroy the work object. OK, we return from the service constructor, which returns from the ASIO round robin constructor, which returns from use scheduling algorithm. The application launches some number of fibers, which are launched as ready but have not yet been entered. Finally, the default fiber calls IO service run. Now what? We've associated a work object with this IO service instance, so the run call doesn't immediately return as it otherwise might. But nothing else has initiated any ASIO operations yet. Without that initial post in the service constructor, nothing would happen. The application would simply hang. So let's look at the lambda we posted. The lambda enters a long running loop until you call IO service stop. If there are ready fibers, we share a few cycles with ASIO. IO service poll runs any handlers that are ready immediately, but it doesn't wait for handlers to become ready. Then we run any ready fibers. Then we loop back to check again. When there are no ready fibers, we call IO service run one. This is where we give up control to ASIO. A run one call does not return until a handler has been run or the IO service is stopped. Run one returns zero only when the IO service is stopped. In that case, we break the loop and return from the Lambda. Otherwise, run one is telling us that it did run some handler. This handler might have caused one or more fibers to become ready, so we loop back to check again. I'm skipping the awakened, pick next, and has ready fibers implementations because they're cribbed from the default round robin implementation. That's why the ASIO aware scheduler is called ASIO round robin. Yes? So you basically just uh, implemented the number of <laughs> 
Right, well, let me talk about why that particular implementation here. Why are we calling run one in the lambda loop? Why not call it in suspend until? Isn't that what suspend until is designed to do? Why, in fact, test has ready fibers in the lambda loop? It matters who's asking. Look at the lambda again. The only fiber APIs it engages are has ready fibers and this fiber yield. Yield doesn't block the calling fiber. It doesn't stop being ready. It is immediately passed to SCED algorithm awakened, so it will resume when everyone else has had a turn. So from the scheduler's point of view, there is always at least one ready fiber. As long as this lambda loop is still running, the fiber manager does not call suspend until because it always has a fiber ready to run. But the lambda loop itself can detect the case when there are no other fibers ready to run. The currently running fiber isn't ready, it's running. That about wraps up what I wanted to share with you here today. One additional point of interest, the fiber library is coming up for its next boost review real soon now. If you're interested, I encourage you not only to check it out, but submit a review. It's also on the Boost Incubator site. You don't have to wait for the review announcement. Questions? Uh, you first. So in the previous slide, hmm. yeah, it looks like uh, part of the schedule, scheduling logic, but it's like uh, outside of scheduling. Yes. Well, as I said, I'm not convinced that this is the optimal solution. It's what we have so far. Okay. And I would very much love it if you would propose something that is more elegant and easier to reason about as the way to seamlessly trade control with ASIO. So you uh, have a um, scheduler manager per thread? I call it a fiber manager per thread, yes. And then um, the scheduler is another object that is consulted by the fiber manager the scheduler is a customization point for the fiber manager. So it's all per thread, manager and scheduler. In every thread, you have different. Yes. So when we were sharing um, the fibers between threads, we had two different scheduler instances, both looking at the static queue instance. Yes. I was wondering about the debugging stuff. Right. I agree with you. The question or the comment was it would be nice for debugging software to become aware of fibers so that you could lay out the stacks for each of the running fibers and select between them. I totally agree. So far I've gotten what I want by using GDB and examining the running fibers stack. Um, again, because these things happen at well-defined times, that usually suffices for my purpose. or switch among them. The comment was, it might be nice to have a plugin for GDB that would allow you to inspect the different stacks and I said, or perhaps switch among them. Um, yes, I agree with you, it would be nice. That would be great. Feel free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Oliver, the author of the uh, fiber library, wrote this code. And I badgered him until I got a full explanation. So you're getting the explanation that I got. Um, so I actually agree with you that maybe it would make sense to say, well, there are still ready fibers. Let's run those ready fibers. Let's do some ASIO. Let's check for ready fibers again. Um, this is what he has. It works. Um, and I just haven't 
played with permuting it too much yet. Yes, and that's the distressing limitation that I mentioned. Um, I guess you could scale it the other way. You could have multiple I.O. services in a thread if you wanted, but this implementation of the integration scheduler is only aware of one I.O. service. If you were going to have multiple I.O. services on a given thread, you'd probably want the fiber scheduler to be aware of them all. Yes. Okay. Okay. Let me speak to that. Um, the comment was um, Boost ASIO already has support for coroutines and isn't it possible that there will be a deeper integration with fibers in Boost ASIO? So there, that's kind of a two-part answer. Um, the first part is that um, the, remember I said that you can think of the fiber library t as coroutines plus a manager to own the instances plus some sort of um, scheduler. And in the case of coroutines, ASIO can be made to function as the fiber as the manager that owns the instances because the coroutine instances are literally copied into the handler and also as the scheduler because ASIO does the scheduling. And Chris Koloff, the author of the ASIO library, wrote the integration with coroutines. Um, he has not yet provided anything comparable for fibers. I don't think that's because he's uninterested. I think it's because he's very busy trying to shepherd the ASIO proposal through the ISO process. Um, I would like to see certain changes in ASIO to better support integration with fibers. And one of them would be, how about if I could have a marker on a handler such that it would only be executed on a particular thread, even if there are multiple threads calling into this same IO service instance. Um, that would be a plausible PR to try to submit and see where I went with it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, I suggest that the <coughs> uh, coroutine support in ASIO um, is a first step. It was what we had when coroutines was all we had before fibers. I actually think fibers give us a, a more complete answer. And um, as you've seen, there are already several different ways to approach integrating fibers with ASIO. I think that there will evolve a best integration with ASIO, but until then, they work. And yes, you do get fiber local storage. Other questions? Yes. Okay, the question was, we have a fiber manager and a scheduler within the fiber library, and then a specialization right, just for... Right, because you rely heavily on the availability for some async that you provide, right? Mm-hmm. And without that, you wouldn't be able to yield, you wouldn't be able to set up on I.O., right? Yes. So, if, maybe I misunderstood it completely, but it looks like you have an implementation of those managers and the schedulers for the Asia, right? Yeah. I haven't built an alternative implementation for other schedulers, but I like that the scheduler is a customization point. So the round robin implementation provided by the fiber library is a default. If you don't override the default scheduler, that's what you get. And the ability to provide 
a specific scheduler that integrates with some other framework, I think is one of the strengths of the library. I personally, in, in our application, we actually have a whole lot of async I.O. that is not mediated by Boost ASIO. Um, it's just Homebrew doing async I.O. on, uh, well, doing non-blocking I.O. behind the scenes, but that's a whole other question. Um, and we have this framework that was built up 10, 12 years ago. And I just integrate the fibers with it based on the callback functionality. And I did stick a yield call into our main loop. <laughs> Portable between operating systems. So, um, the. How much extra work do I have to do? I think the library must be able to support the socket, so the shared memory for the cell ports. If I want to get notification to those. I see. The question was, how much extra work would he have to do in order to get um, fiber support for semaphores? Well, yeah, not just simple file using and file descriptive I.O. kind, but different premises. So if I understand your question, the question is, um, if I have an operating system operation that is going to block my whole thread, how can I transition to a fiber aware implementation of that? Is well, that what it's not exactly how, but I mean looking at the well considering the beautifulness of fibers, right? Mm -hmm. I would take an existing application that just runs mm -hmm. and that it here if it has a bit of blocking on extreme the blocking iterations, right? And waiting for some notifications from other applications. And then suppose I want to you know, speed it up and take advantage of fibers. So now for every single system code I'm making and that can potentially block, I have to invent the way of well, uh, getting the notification when uh, that particular object becomes raised and things like that. So do you have any anything implemented in those areas for raising? Not just a generic infrastructure, but something that would be available mm -hmm. for an immediate port. I don't know to what extent I'm going to be able to repeat all of that, but um, the synopsis, and you'll correct me if I get this wrong, is that there's a wide range of blocking operating system calls that you might want to cut over into non-blocking or async functionality in order to be able to use fibers in the application. And so you remember the slide where I said that fibers are the best way I know to organize code that's already committed to using async I.O. That's part of the reason. Now, the scenario in which you discover that there is a blocking operation on some fiber and you wish that it wasn't blocking is much less damaging to your maintenance effort than the scenario in which you are multiple levels deep in threadless, uh, sorry, in stackless resumable functions and you discover that uh-oh, I need to not block here. I need to make this an async operation because all of a sudden a function that never used to suspend before is going to have to suspend. And you have to propagate the need to suspend all the way back up to the top level. That with quite the I did not ask for the benefits why yes. they would be better than code. I know, I just couldn't resist jumping on the soapbox. Right. So, of course, fundamentally, the question is whether your environment, your operating system, or your um, system libraries already support both a blocking and an, and an async version of the operation. If you can't even get an async version of the operation, you're kind of hosed. If there already is one, then how hard is it to adapt that to use this? I've been using the pattern I showed you with Future and Promise. Um, but could it be made more generic? Possibly. Um, will the fiber library itself provide uh, asynchronous versions of all of these operations? No, I don't believe so, but I think that ASIO is going to try. I think that ASIO is where you're going to find the non-blocking or asynchronous 
versions of a lot of the underlying system operations. And I think that that's where they're going to be extended as more and more asynchronous system operations become available. And I think that um, the ability to leverage ASIO's asynchrony wrapped in fibers is, you know, the way that I expect this will go forward. Yes? Yes, it is. Yes, and in fact, um, one of the things that I that we touched on a bit ago is remember the question was about why do I need a mutex if um, fibers are completely cooperative within a thread? And the answer is well, you know, maybe you need to coordinate resources between threads, and so you can have a fiber instantiate a fiber's promise on one th thread, but have the future, sorry, have the promise be fulfilled by an operation, possibly a blocking operation, on a completely different thread. That's safe. And so it's a way of dispatching potentially blocking operations off onto a completely separate thread. So that is a way of an adapting um, a blocking operation to get it off of the thread on which you're trying to share all of your fibers. It's a good question. <laughs> I'm being told that time is up. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs>